thank you for, for joining us here to talk about um, the, the state of the internet, what we know about it. Um, just to uh, start before, um, before we get into introductions, um, just want to see show of hands. Um, how many uh, of you all, raise your hand please, if you um, have a uh, mobile data subscription. So you have a, a, a mobile device that is connected to the internet particularly. Okay. What about, um, uh, keep your hand raised if you have a home broadband subscription. Okay. Most but not, but not as many. Um, now for either of those, raise your hand if you feel um, like it is uh, high quality. Either of those products is high quality. Okay. Um, and uh, what if you um, raise your hand if you feel like it costs more than it should? Okay. It's interesting. But I, that's what you know. I, you often um, I've been doing. slow or too expensive, uh, generally people say too expensive, um, or it's funny to say we keep getting sold faster, faster. but um, uh, what we'll get into today is the New York City Internet Master Plan and just generally what we know about the, the state of the internet and, and how we know it. Um, uh, I'll, you know, just a spoiler alert, uh, the, the internet does not work for all New Yorkers, it does not serve all New Yorkers. Um, and there's a little bit of balance to consider uh, who, who it does work for and um, uh, who it does not work for and what we would need to change uh, to make it work for all. Um, my name is Joshua Breitbart. I'm the Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the Mayor's Office of the CTO. I direct the city's broadband strategy. Um, just a brief introduction, if you haven't had a chance to read the New York City Internet Master Plan, uh, it's available online as a, as a PDF. Uh, there are some uh, hard copy versions as well. Um, and what it really does, and this is all in the executive summary, uh, is uh, lay out the vision and principles uh, for the internet in New York City. Um, equity, performance, affordability, privacy is the choice. Uh, guide what we do. Um, it uh, documents the current state of the internet. So we have uh, three people joining us uh, uh, in this session today who are going to speak to this in, um, uh, in a range of different ways. Um, and uh, we also then will have some time for question and answers for people to either you know, ask about um, the data that's available and how to make use of it, since this is a huge pool of data. Um, and that's our focus here, but also to better understand and hear from you your thoughts about how you fit into this, because ultimately, um, you know, we have we have data talking about millions of New Yorkers, but ultimately, what it comes down to is, is each person, each household, each community, and what you want to do uh, with the technology that is potentially available uh, or today available to some, and, uh, and hopefully in the future available. Um, so um, I'm going to allow the, the panelists, ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Ariel, would you please start? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ariel Benjamin, and I am the
Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Emil Mora. I'm the community coordinator and the theater coordinator of the Porn Street Street. So we are in North Park Street, so based in Hunt Point, the Hunt Point section of the South Bronx. Um, how many of you are familiar with Hunt Point? Yeah? Okay, cool. So we have an interesting mix over there of some of the activity and food and people and all that kind of thing. Okay, so we just have to come down. Yeah, so. Basically, we were working with Sarah and Doug and a bunch of other cool people. We did a night night work in Hunt Point, and that's the parking space, so it's a relatively loose idea of like a community and community. That's it. So my partner is Doug, and she's a good friend. Hi, I'm Sarah Byron. Um, I am the research intern for the New School for Social Research on um, digital equity. Try and click a couple of sure. these on. Can, uh, sit yeah, if you could 
just move closer and talk into the mic or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. Just move closer and talk into the mic. Okay. Great. <laughs> I, think, I think if you just if you say a little back and just project, it'll be fine. Everybody, if you right. agree, just move forward a couple yeah. feet and, and then just, just switch them on when you need them. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be like a social distancing uh, <laughs> yeah, ideal. Uh, it's okay, we're all friends. You guys are welcome <laughs> to stay. I promise. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So. The economic impact analysis measures the incremental growth once assuming ubiquitous broadband connectivity. So once everyone in New York is connected to broadband, what that means um, in terms of new jobs, in terms of more personal spending income, um, and in terms of economic growth, kind of like a GCP number. Yeah, and um, Greta, can you talk a bit about the qualitative data? Yeah, so, um, you know, as Ariel was mentioning, there's a lot of sort of flaws and difficulty with um, how public data um, about broadband is, you know, mapped and analyzed and, like, produced. Um, so the FCC data that Ariel mentioned, there's the problem of, you know, the quality of the data going into that with, um, you know, that's historically been sort of a political football, and there's lots of folks that have written really good analyses of, you know, why that data is not great. Carl Bode has written some really good work about that. And then with the um, census data on, on broadband um, in people's homes, a lot of the questions, that's, you know, survey-based data, and a lot of the questions are um, confusing. So, you know, do you know whether you have a cable provider or DSL provider or, you know, so things like that that, like, a lot of normal people just don't know um, when they go to answer those questions. And so both of the main data sets that we have for broadband are confusing, and we also see, um, confusing and inadequate, I would say, we also see that there's, um, you know, things move very fast in the world of broadband, so how are people actually interacting with networks and with data? changes really rapidly, so there's a lag time with data collection. Um, this is also really complicated data in the sense that it's what I would call socio-technical, so that means you have a whole bunch of social factors interacting with technical factors. And so um, officially, you know, um, our part of the work, the New School team's part of the work was to look at um, how much can people actually pay for broadband in New York City? And we just found um, there's so many variables in that question that we really had to dive into um, qualitative data, meaning talking to people about how they feel, um, what's impacting their ability to pay for broadband service, how are they actually using the internet and, and connected um, technologies. And um, <clears throat> so how we did that was really to dive into qualitative research processes um, and to really structure qualitative data um, in, a, in a very rigorous way. Um, and so we did, um, we did structured interviews and we did focus groups and then we took, all, we took, you know, a massive amount of just what we heard from people and we coded all of this data. Um, so Josh, do you want to pull up? Yeah. So this is just an example of what a code sheet looked like. So we, we basically have like two master code sheets that both have just very rich qualitative data in them. Um, and this one, you can see we sort of landed on a set of kind of descriptors that helped shape recommendations around ability to pay. So those were comfort, um, internet literacy, safety and privacy concerns. I could talk about why we sort of landed on these um, categories um, which informed our recommendations. Um, I think, you know, a really important one would be um, emergent mobility. So this has to do with how people are cutting the cord and how wireline, home-based, broadband access, it, it's, you know, the dynamics of how people use that with comparison to uh, mobile internet is really changing as, you know, younger people are much more likely to use mobile broadband. People are using um, mobile data as they move through the city, through their day. 
So we're just seeing, you know, it used to be sort of in broadband policy that the end result of an, a successful broadband strategy would be people have internet at home. And we didn't, we didn't find, you know, that's irrelevant or people don't need that anymore, but we did find that it's more complex than that. Because, you know, for example, people with um, unstable housing situations, they need to be able to get on their email at lots of different places during the day, especially if they're awaiting an email about employment. Um, younger people um, are really innovating with mobile devices and mobile technologies. And so they're using um, what I, this is emergent mobility. They're using um, mobile broadband in ways that we haven't seen before. So starting to capture some of these much more complicated um, dynamics that informed um, that inform people's ability to pay what they want to pay for, what they're able to pay for, how much they're able to pay, what they're balancing their broadband um, cost against in their calculations. These are all just too complex to kind of capture with the kind of data that we had from FCC. And yeah, and got it. I like. And so as you were yep. doing this qualitative research, we were going back into our quantitative numbers and rethinking in the way that we were, which data we were pulling, but also how we were aggregating it. <coughs> so like we started from a place just wanting to connect all New Yorkers to broadband at home. But then that principle like quickly expanded because we realized how important it is to be, to have access both in the public realm, but anywhere you go. And maybe your mobile, your mobile service is also your home service because that's what you can afford or that's your preference. And so we started thinking about what do people pay today for both their home internet and for their, their mobile service. And when you add those two numbers up, it gets to be pretty ridiculous. Um, and how could we better, how can we create infrastructure like in, in the city that provides for the expansion of both kinds of networks throughout it, different yeah, technologies? So we, the, um, sorry, just, just also want to point out, so we also, there were more than 50 stakeholder interviews uh, that were, uh, or responses to a request for information that are also gathered, as well as engineering studies um, uh, looking at what uh, the, the physical condition of the city is um, at key points throughout the city. And uh, all of this data is um, more or less, uh, all this data is compiled in, in open data, um, broken down by different groups and uh, sort of different geographies. Um, and um, compiling this together. Um, when I first started working uh, for the city about five years ago, I, I think there may have been one open data set that referred to anything about broadband connectivity, and we now have you know, a significant uh, you know, run of, of all this data, and um, if, you, if you open it up and let you to look at it, uh, it's a, um, you know, it's a significant number of indicators, each at the um, neighborhood level. Um, you know, some of the things are, uh, you know, totally new information they can't necessarily find about every other city, and some of it is, um, as, as Ariel and, and Greta were saying, uh, federal data that's been, um, you know, analyzed at the, at the local level and put into a form that people are familiar with open data would, would be able to use. Um, I do want to ask um, Emil, can you speak to to what um, uh, what the point is doing, and you know what what is not captured at this sort of like sort of citywide data level that you see at the neighborhood level? Yeah, um, so I'm very surprised to hear you all talk about data this way. Um, uh, I want to just put something out there first. I'm, I'm not data expert in any way. Um, I'm learning here. I'm actually a musician and a singer. <laughs> <laughs> and I happen to run a Wi-Fi project. But that has a lot to say also as much as what can each one of us do for our <coughs> communities and for our peers. Um, there's just so much that is not captured. I, I don't know because I don't master this data sets. But what I could tell you is that um, in my experience, there's compelling stories that, that drive this data collection. And then hopefully these data sets will tell compelling stories that will shape policy and help us make our city better or, or compel people that speak data um, to 
and move and do things. I can tell you like that uh, certainly my work with young people has taught me a lot in, in terms of what you're saying, like the way that they use the internet. So um, I could tell you that some of the people in the pictures that you see there, they don't even have internet at home. They just, uh, for example, Tony and, um, Tony and Chris, they, they don't have internet at home. They are uh, uh, three brothers and they, they uh, live with their mother, a uh, single mother raising them, and, and all they have is their phones. And until they started doing the digital stewardship with me, they didn't even have phones. So these are young people growing up in, in the Bronx, and they had to just go to libraries to, to do their homework. Mr. Marshall is also a digital steward, and he certainly has no internet access at home. He goes to the point to do his business or to apply for work and everything else. Um, so these are just the stories of people that are Bronx natives or Bronx sites. And even Alejandra, she lives in our block. And there's something weird that happens in the middle of her block. There is no connectivity, right? So I'm connected to Optimum, but the three hot spots I have a blind spot that's right by my house, mm -hmm. so I can never get the, the three hot spots. So she she is like this this omission, like the, there's not enough signal to get to her house. But um, you know, um, another thing that I, I would point out, for example, that is uh, we we've learned in our like local environment is like that generational um, gaps or differences also shape our internet environment for everybody. For example, our block is a block that is of homeowners, you know, people that own their houses. And we need access to the roofs in order to put antennas. But it turns out that most of these people, they're seniors. So they don't care about the internet. They don't want to have the internet. And they're more concerned about their privacy. So it takes a lot of demystifying the internet and teaching and also building relationships and trust to get the cooperation so that then we can serve all the people that do need the internet. And you know, that work could be done by anybody, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Um, yeah, I think that was, I think, one of the, one of the things that's really difficult to find in the data is one of, one of those unique strengths mm -hmm. um, and resources yeah, yeah. Um, and those, uh, you know, the organizers in the community, uh, you know, the American, the census doesn't ask you, like, are you a community organizer? Can you can you help build with your neighbors to to to, to solve problems and, and create new solutions? Um, that's something that doesn't really come through in, in the in the federal data. Greta, do you want to talk about why it was important to to create that sort of neighborhood framework in, in the in the plan? Yeah, for sure. So you know, I think um, one of the things about creating any sort of um, plan for internet access or policies around internet access is that what you're really going for is not necessarily internet access as much as you're trying to hit other um, targets around um, community well-being. So access to opportunity, you know, employment, housing, like pretty much, you know, the things that, that communities um, need and are already working on. And so, um, you know, when you think about the effectiveness of a plan or like, is this doing what we want it to do? Um, how do you kind of understand the impact that it's having beyond just connecting people to the internet? Um, and so as we were working, um, we were talking to folks like Emil who are really engaged with their communities and the point, you guys just celebrated what, your 20th, 25th anniversary. So the point has been doing this amazing work in the South Bronx for 25 years, and it's an arts-focused organization, but so tied to um, all kinds of advocacy in that community. And so any initiative that's going to work in terms of broadband and is going to make broadband work in order to reach these other goals around like housing and education and employment, it has to be tied to what's already working in the community. So working with an organization like the, the point and understanding what are their priorities, what are their resources, what's already happening in this community, and how could we connect that with um, understanding needs around broadband and also understanding how to support 
um, you know, how broadband could ultimately support the other goals that they're trying to reach. And so a lot of what we were trying to do was like gather that data in such a way that we could help tell those stories and bring those stories into the frame for the planning process. And Ariel, you, you mentioned before trying to think like an ISP. From that perspective, why do you think it's important to, to break the city down into the, uh, what city planning calls these neighborhood tabulation areas? Sure. So we very quickly discovered that a one-size-fits-all solution wasn't, wasn't going to work for a city, for any place, but especially for a city as complex and nuanced as New York. And I think Josh has some maps up here, but you'll kind of see repeated patterns of Manhattan and the denser, higher-income neighborhoods of New York City being served pretty well, fairly well, by, by internet service, and that the outer boroughs and the lower-income neighborhoods really just lacking kind of a basic standard. And so we found there's a, a few advantages of breaking it into neighborhoods. One, of course, was the ability to zoom in and really to diagnose both the problem and then hypothesize potential solutions or position potential solutions um, for partnerships down the road. There's also this idea of kind of seeding expansion. New York is so big that um, that new internet service providers aren't used to kind of tackling a territory the size of like our city here. It's like eight and a half million people, five boroughs, different counties, all of that. So by breaking down our planning process into neighborhoods, we thought of this approach, something that can come up in our, our USB, our universal solicitation for broadband maybe, that, um, that would allow smaller players to come in, kind of start new, get get their sea legs really in a neighborhood and build both momentum and build the types of adoption and financial considerations that they need to continue to expand. Yeah, and I think um, it was also, I think it also helped with you know, two other things in addition to what you're saying. You know, or to, to your point, the companies that are, that are here and have been here know a lot of this stuff just sort of, you know, because they're out there doing it. But if newcomers are, are going to come in, you know, how do how do we use data to create a level playing field for, for those to come in? I think it also helped be, um, in dealing with some of the problems in the data we talked about before, because rather than just being really focused on what is the number of the, you know this particular unit, we could start to see patterns. And so even if there were if there are flaws in some of the data, the patterns. Um, matched what we understood uh, you know, to be the case based on our direct observations and the expert interviews that we were conducting. Um, we yeah, to, to put a point on it, the relativity was huge. Being able to understand one neighborhood's level of access to the next neighborhood's level of access really helped us pinpoint maybe what the problem was or, or what the solution could be. Um, so should we take some questions from the audience? Is that Art? Um, I'm here, I'm down here from Albany, and about nine years ago I got involved with uh, advocating for community broadband, and, you know, I just, my nature is to delve into stuff and try to figure it out, you know, and figure out what systematically and structural, structural problems are, and so, you know, some of the same problems, I'm also a member of the several collaboratives and the rural uh, broadband congress and all that. And so some of the same problems that you have here, we have there in the rural uh, communities. Um, any of you, I know some of, the, some of the school districts do and are using the Sprint One Million Project Foundation. Mm -hmm. We have some around here that are using it because I, I Yeah, we have about uh, partnership that's about 30,000 uh, units with that partnership. So we're, we're just found, finding out about the Sprint One Million Project Foundation. And for those of you that don't know, uh, there's about five million students in America that have, they're either, you know, don't have the resources at home to connect, to do their homework. And about 70% of what kids do for homework now requires media to complete it. Just simple and plain as that. It's, you know, if you don't if you have it, you, you know, you got to go rush out to some place where, you know, that you might not be able to get it done so you show up to school without homework done and enough time to doing that the kids basically become discouraged and ultimately drop out and 
that starts that whole school to prison pipeline and all that stuff potentially being populated. And so Sprint made a you know a compact with whoever, the Department of Education and the government or their board or whoever decided they were gonna they were gonna take on a million of that five million. And so that's where that program came. And they offer Wi Fi uh, access or you can get a cell phone, but the whole idea is to turn on a hotspot so that the kids can do their homework safely at home as opposed to having to come back from you know, McDonald's or the library or whatever at 9 yeah. o'clock at night. So we're, we're just finding out about that. And so, you know, we, we actually went through our first model was with, uh, with in Rochester. Uh, free and reduced lunch uh, measures for Rochester is about 98%. That nobody had access. 18, we had 2,100 people that responded. 1,850 needed access at home. Right. So imagine the, the gravity of that problem. Uh, and so that we started there. And anyway, th those are the kind of problems and kind of things that I get involved in up in Albany. And I get involved in helping communities find, you know, resources to, you know, because we, you know, we don't have AT&T in a lot of places or charter yeah. or whatever. One of the one of the things that we saw in really you know diving into the the situation in New York City um, and and understanding that we ha you know in the case of um, Department of Education had this partnership with Sprint which was the largest single partnership within that whole program of anywhere in the country you know we had um, the largest partnership under the um, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development's Connect Home program. Um, we have the largest uh, system of public computer centers offering um, you know, free free resources of any city in the country, and and yet we still face the, the disparities and the challenges and the gaps that we had. So we understood, um, you know, as you as you heard uh, before, that there was not going to be a, a one size fits all solution or a single partnership. And so the interim master plan provides a, a framework for bringing a portfolio of solutions, a portfolio of partnerships. So um, understanding that in some cases communities uh, are taking action, taking actions themselves. How can we better understand the impact of that approach, uh, while also looking at other areas where there's you know just not the, not the infrastructure in the ground, um, and that that may require some other types of capital investment from from private or, or public and private partnerships right. uh, to make that happen. Um, Greta, do you want to speak a little bit to the the types of um, community planning processes that you use um, both in uh, in partnership with urban communities as well as rural communities? Um, so, yeah, so I've worked with um, urban and rural communities to build um, local broadband. And, um, you know, I think generally the the rule that that always works for me in all those contexts is um, to really talk to people about what's already happening in the community. So it's exactly what I said before. This is about you know what are people concerned about? What's going to get people motivated to get involved in a process? Um, and so that like if if I come in, my team comes in. Um, you know, saying like, let's build broadband together um, that we don't then leave in a couple of years and, um, you know, sort of leave something that that people don't feel like invested in and feel like they own locally. So, I mean, I feel like actually, Yamil, you might be uh, better at talking about the process that we've engaged with on that. Um, but, you know, I think it's sort of a... Um, diving into really some of the social complexities that are going on in neighborhoods at the same time that you're doing some knowledge transfer about how broadband works and how broadband could address some of those. Does that seem right to you? Yeah. <laughs> what, so what, what, like, I mean, we worked together starting in 2016, right? And it's taken some time to build a network. Um, but what do you feel like you, you, what are you all using the network for? So like what beyond just getting people on the internet, what, what is, you know, happening in, in your neighborhood as far as the goals that you have there? Well, I, I can answer that, but I would also love to hear them talk about it. Um, 
You guys want to say something? Yeah, you can do it. Turn, Turn on, on your mic. Turn on your mic. How are we using the internet? So, um, my name is Alejandra. I work with Jamil. Uh, I'm the graphic designer at the point, and I got involved in the Wi Fi project to, uh, because I live and work in the community. And a few years ago, six years ago, when survey happened, uh, we are a waterfront community, a peninsula, and we were affected by it. Luckily, it was a low tide, but that opened the eyes of what we can do for resiliency in our community related to uh, different aspects. And Y5 was one of the initiatives that came out for the community. Uh, the other initiative was um, electric um, grid, or is that how you call Micro -grid. it? Microgrid. Microgrid for the food center that is the biggest food center in the in the city in, in the probably world. in the world and so to protect the the the, the market was uh, the electric grid and for the community it was like a sense of uh, how we communicate in case of emergency and how we prepare so two things came out the the wi-fi project as well as a page uh, with Hans Point NYC that we de that I developed with my intern here, Luis, and this is our two digital stores that are really doing the work that we talk about. And um, yeah, so it's a question of resiliency for us as much as access. Um, yeah, let's come back with a hat. You, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I'll just say, I think that one of the initial ideas also is to, by looking at the city as neighborhood, to, to understand what, um, the, what, is, what exists within each neighborhood and what, um, what can come next, and then, and then leveraging the city's um, real estate assets and data to bring in new partnerships, but to use them to build on what exists already in, in each area. So, whether it's the existing infrastructure, the existing partnerships, the existing public computer centers, uh, or just the existing buildings that the city might have access to, that those become the resources that are made available um, you know, within the, each neighborhood. Um, and you know, I think one of the one of the one of the key things is going to be, um, and I think one of the challenges. I'd love to hear people speak more to this. Is um, as we were saying before, what is not captured in the data that is essential to making those partnerships work? Um, what some of the, the social infrastructure, the, the, you know, the, 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 the cultural history, the human relationships uh, that are really essential to making sure the internet is not just there as a product, but contributing to the needs of each community. Um, I think what we've, what we've tried to do is create a data framework to address the infrastructure aspects of that um, but then from within the neighborhood level, there really has to be a, a collaborative process that happens from, from there on, and that's the, the next phase of the work. Yeah, and just to add that, sorry, you may ask me. Go ahead. Uh, well, one thing is any broadband project like what The Point is doing, um, and I don't know how to turn this mic on anymore, but. Come on. It's malfunctioning. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Woo. So any like local broadband project, they're gonna have to purchase um, internet from a wholesaler, right? So making, I think the, the city level planning partly goes into like create, making sure that there's, there's like companies that they can buy from in order to then distribute locally. So that's one way that I think the big picture and the little picture come together. Um, and then also, you know, I think it's really interesting what Yamil was saying about privacy. Um, it's definitely something that we found in our research is that you, you have to start to understand really complex things like how do people feel about privacy in a neighborhood like 
um, Hunts Point, where there's like a lot of immigrant communities, a lot of people facing many different kinds of, you know, challenges and, and, um, and so, you know, privacy is not just about people nervous about being hacked, it's also people nervous about surveillance, people nervous about political targeting, um, you know, harassment. And so really understanding dynamics like that, then you start to understand what kind of programming would help this community not only interact with the internet, but do it in a way that helps them achieve like what they want to see in their community. Um, sorry, to, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to add to what you say and also what Fred is saying. Because your initial question is about how Link NYC kind of like meets community <coughs> networks and how do I see it in White and like Hunts Point? How do we look at it? Well, uh, let me tell you, I think Link NYC, NYC is, a, is a very great opportunity to find sources of backhole, you know, that connection to the internet for community networks like us. I uh, look forward to see this considered uh, somehow in the master plan. Because what we're doing is different from ISPs, and we want to make that a very important difference, um, make that clear. So there should be, I believe, opportunity for community networks to have backhaul at affordable prices. Now, I want to add something. I want to say something that, and I believe that um, I, I'm a great champion and believer in the digital stewardship. I think everything, every, everything starts there uh, for solutions at the local community level, from my perspective. You can see I've had, uh, you know, gentlemen and young people in my workshops. And it is key to know that not everybody will be able to build maybe an installation, but everybody in the community needs to understand to a certain degree what the internet is capable of and how it affects you so that we can all contribute to the health of the, our digital environment. And that's a way to activate our community and organize. So I think that's a key thing. And, and we did also, there is a, another report we did um, looking at free public Wi-Fi in New York City, uh, where for the first time, instead of just looking at all Wi-Fi as if it's created equal, um, starting to break it down in terms of uh, apply, you know, having the same sort of principles and standards that we have in the Internet Master Plan, um, but understanding the use cases, because you know, a community network uh, might not be the same purpose as what's in a library. It might not be the same thing as what's put out on a you know, commercial corridor. Um, and it's not necessarily about having 100% of everything covered. It's about having people's needs uh, met and doing that equitably and to a high quality throughout the city. Um, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sorry. I'm like a little bit anxiously raising my hand. Um, so one thing that's concerning me is, um, so I work in the, the data science and machine learning field, and um, all of the companies I'm competing against or my colleagues work at, none of them are in, are in New York City. Uh, the nearest competitor is in Toronto, and then you have um, in San Francisco, and uh, a huge cost, a huge reason for that is the, um, the distance from the data centers and the, um, the when you talk about computational load, the speed of the internet connection. So one thing that really concerns me is the, like, what's the fastest internet connection you can get from here to, let's just say, um, you know, across the river to Newark. Um, I mean, like, my understanding is that it's um, inadequate, but I guess I'm just wondering you know, if that's something that you're addressing, and is there any data that you are trying to get? Or? Yeah. yeah, well, I'll just say that the, um, you know, that's another way of looking, uh, another way of asking the question about what does it mean for, what does all this data mean for the point? Because you have a very specific use case, and it's very difficult to present a, a citywide understanding that speaks to the specific needs of each business and, and each uh, and each individual. Um, and you know, if you ask that question about a connection from here to, to Newark, uh, and we were you know in Lower Manhattan, it'd be a different answer than if we're in Long Island City, and it'd be a different answer than if we're in Coney Island. Uh, and so, you know, I'm I'm happy to speak with you about the the specifics of uh, you know businesses and where you might be located, um, but. You know, for some parts of the city, and just generally, we do have a lot more fiber operators, commercial fiber operators in New York City than almost any other city has. But, but, but if your office is located further from where most of them are concentrated, that might not be you know enough for you. Um, and if what you need is um, you know an internet connection to be able to to do homework you know at home at night versus compete with the largest data science firms, you know, globally, you know, that use case is, is also going to be quite different. And so 
understand, and I think one of the things that we did find in the area, maybe we can speak to this, is that um, one of the things that, that um, ubiquitous uh, high-speed commercial connectivity could unlock a lot more uh, business opportunities in more parts of the city, Erin, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. And these business opportunities kind of span a whole gamut from uh, small business creations and, you know, anything from retail along, like, major corridors to um, startups and tech businesses that are trying to grow. I think that there's there's a correlation between rents and, and access to broadband. It's wrapped up in many, many other factors. It's, it's not a direct correlation, but um, the fact that right now, cheaper places to locate your, your businesses and your offices don't have the same strength in broadband connectivity, nor the same number of choices in commercial fiber offerings. So you wind up paying more for getting less. It's the same thing on the residential side. So the idea is that if there was choice and, and good quality choices kind of across the city, you're unlocking new um, new business growth opportunities in places like Jamaica or places like Hunts Point, um, Jerome Ave, and South Bronx. And so we, we looked at that a lot, and it's certainly a benefit to economic competitiveness of the city. And, and just you know, two of the indicators here that are mapped are the, the commercial fiber choice, which is really about do you have three options in the neighborhood, and the coverage, which is within the neighborhood, um, how much of that area has no, has no commercial fiber, um, which we've talked about, so you how much you might have to pay up front in order to get that connection. Uh, in the gray area. Hi, uh, I'm Franz, I'm a librarian. And I just actually had a question, uh, sort of going back to the community. What's it like for a community to, uh, or what are the things that can make community the challenges for uh, purchasing, like, uh, uh, internet service? Like, I mean, how does that work? Like, how does a community buy internet service? And what are the challenges? Um, yeah, so challenges include, you know, this is the commercial um, fiber availability map, but there's also, you guys have a map that's just um, how many ISPs are operating in different communities. So in a place that only has one internet service provider, which is actually a lot of New York City communities, um, that ISP probably doesn't want to sell bulk bandwidth to um, a community that's going to redistribute it, right? So, and um, definitely won't sell it cheaper in a way right. that that community is unable to make the Wi-Fi free or right. highly affordable. So that's where something like a public-private partnership is great, where um, you know you have um, a partnership that already makes it, you know, where the, say, the private sector partner is already sort of bought into how do we support this community in terms of social outcomes. Um, so that's, that's one way to go. Um, the project that um, that I worked on with Emil, which was um, the Economic Development Corporation of New York City investing in connectivity and Sandy impacted communities. Um, for that project, we tried to purchase at least two connections per neighborhood so that we could be sure that if one got flooded and went out, um, then there would be another connection. And that was really a struggle in some places. And also it was hard um, because it's not easy to find the information of who provides service where. And so we ended up in some cases just having to Google like <laughs> ISPs in my neighborhood um, because you know it's not easy to, to get that information. And so a lot of stuff kind of runs through who, who knows who. Um, you know, so like we worked with a technology provider that knew a lot of the ISPs personally. And so a lot of it was personal connections. It's, it, so it, when you get to that, part of it it's it's still pretty dicey um and yeah not cheap um so yeah so you kind of have to uh, so it's like a combination of financial and legal yes and it's really about the terms of service so you know with the deep redistribution of a bandwidth um the bulk bandwidth that you purchase it's about the terms of service with that provider not about legality in that case and then also sorry just a sort of piggyback on that question. I saw that you've been flashing mesh networks. Like, what are the potentials of mesh, mesh networks? You could maybe talk a little bit about ne mesh networks. Um, so that, know, yeah, that's what we're doing. Through. It's That's like a whole nother niche conversation. I would say, generally, it's doable, but difficult in New York City because of um, 
buildings and then there's just a ton of traffic on the Wi-Fi um, signals. But that's pretty much what we did with the point and for other neighborhoods, although I would say they're more like hybrid, not solely mesh because we had to integrate other, you know, point to point. I want to add something to what you said. What the, what the thing that's important or one really great advantage that we built with technology that allows for mm -hmm. mesh so we can yeah. do a hybrid model when needed. Flexibility. I mean, how much does that cost? Cheap. We, let's, so let's, uh, say, I mean, yeah, talk, talk. Yeah. Talk about when we, when we, when we wrap. And, yeah. um, because, you know, I think the other thing is it, it works also under some conditions and it's more challenging under other conditions. So it's really about how do we understand the, the right. right approaches in the right areas. Mm -hmm. uh, you with the, the jacket? Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, so thanks for bringing this panel together. Um, I'm very curious about this master plan. Um, and I think one thing that we should acknowledge here um, is that a big reason that there's not universal coverage in New York City is because it's not profitable. Um, and that it's been a failure of private industry to provide internet uh, and they don't do it where they don't think it's profitable or there's other reasons, but that's a big one. Um, and I also think that there's been a long history we've seen with the city incentivizing private development of ISPs. Um, to oftentimes bad results. If you look at the attempts to get Verizon to uh, put Fios throughout the city, they failed to do so. The city had to sue Verizon and they still didn't complete the job. Um, even with the Link NYC kiosks, we've seen, I just read recently, um, over 500 kiosks are still waiting to be built um, that were supposed to have already been built, not to mention the fact that there's horrendous privacy concerns with those. Um, Meanwhile, there's another plan that we haven't really talked about here, and I'm wondering if this is addressed at all in the, in, in the Internet Master Plan, which would be a real publicly owned ISP. Now, I know that the IBEW, Local 3, which represents the striking spectrum workers, they have said that they support such a plan, a municipal broadband plan. And from where I'm sitting, it seems like a good idea. Like, it's a way to reduce costs. Um, it is a way where you can leverage these things like having capital investment and scale in a way that we would actually be able to wire up bigger parts of the city. Um, and in terms of folks here who would be concerned about data, it's both a way to collect much more municipal data and it's also a way to better regulate uh, the data regarding privacy concerns and do data management and things of this nature. Um, so I like that idea and I'm wondering how that fits into if that was considered with this plan. So uh, I'll say, um, I do think that the, the city, um, city does have uh, strong privacy protections and privacy principles that we exercise. My understanding of the IBEW proposal was a co-op model, which is different from a municipal ownership model. Um, the largest municipally owned uh, ISP it's in your the country. Uh, it's your mic phone. I thought it was on. Um, the, um, the largest municipally owned ISP in the country uh, serves a, a population of about 180,000. So again, if you look at you know, how you could apply those existing models, even in theory in a place like New York City, you'd have to think about where that would work. The current charter network only covers part of the city. So it really is about what's strategic. The, the plan does speak to the, the uh, potential for public investment. Uh, but even there, you have to think about um, where's the right place to focus that uh, to have the greatest impact, and where does it enable n new opportunities uh, rather than uh, you know um, uh, you know not not wind up not wind up having the impact we'd like to have, or um, you know not taking full advantage of the types of contributions that. Um, you know, either community networks or new startup in, you know, service providers or potentially co-op models might be able to do. There's, there's a lot of opportunity for private investment in New York City. Uh, what we want to see is it not happening over and over and over again in the same areas, but spreading out into the areas where um, it, it historically has not happened. Um, I think we're at time. Did you want to, you had one more, you had a question? Did you want to share your, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, so I actually had a relevant question to that, um, which is that what you just described about um, the ISPs and how 
not being really sure like uh, what ISPs are in what area and I know that lots of ISPs have monopolies over their areas if we're not gonna have this kind of municipal broadband plan what are we going to do about these ISPs? Like, how will it be possible for us to make sure that these ISPs are not price gouging? Well, the, the, the threshold that, uh, in, the, in the choice principle is just to have at least, at that least um, which, you know, would be, would be transformative. And it may, in some areas of the city, have more than that. And it may be that over time, there, there would be more than that. Um, but uh, I don't think that's what we should do. I'd say in the course of, of our research for this plan, we spoke to over 50 different folks involved in, in internet service provision, including many ISPs. And there's a lot of niche and community ISPs that are out there that are offering um, great services. They, they protect privacy, um, net, net neutrality, they don't throttle, um, and they charge competitive prices. They struggle in getting a foothold big enough to compete kind of with the incumbents today. So we thought about that in the course of the plan. Um, and also more, uh, one of the theories we kind of operated under is more competition, more choice would just bring better product. It would bring lower prices and better product. Yeah, and it adds that, I mean, I feel like what you're both talking about is market failure, and that's been the problem with, you know, broadband provision in this country for a um, 100 years. And and so, you know, building equity in a place like New York where we're starting from a place where there's radically unequal availability of this infrastructure from place to place, you know, how do you do that in a city this big? And that's really what Josh was pointing at. And so, you know, I think, you know, for example, it's a lot easier to build where Empire City Subway is versus where it isn't. So where there's um, open access conduit or you know common carriage, Empire City Subway, which manages the layer under the streets in Manhattan and the Bronx, they have to rent to anybody. That doesn't exist in Brooklyn and um, uh, Queens. So, and Staten Island, but, um, so, you know, you're really starting from different places and different boroughs. It's an enormous amount of land mass. So how do you address the equity issue, given that, like, undertaking a municipal broadband plan would be, a municipal broadband, becoming a municipal broadband provider would be an enormous undertaking politically, right? So I think there's a couple of things that I, I just want to point to that the Internet Master Plan does include an open access, um, you know, uh, target. So if the city, you know, like Empire City Subway was able to say, like, we are going to rent to anybody who needs conduit um, and they're able to build out that, that kind of open access backbone, that would be an amazing contribution towards beginning to build equity. And then the other thing I would say is, like, franchising is a real, um, you know, it's a dynamic process and that it's something that also everybody can get involved in the public process and try to... You know, when the city is, is making um, plans and is negotiating with um, service providers, that's a, a place for everybody to get involved. You know, it's, and if we sort of just say, like, well, it's up to the city to make sure that people are equally served and there's not kind of like a public demand, you know, we're not going to get there. So that I think, like, we can't just expect the city to do everything. And part of this is about increasing Internet literacy everywhere in every neighborhood and so that's the other part of what we're trying to do with folks like the point um, so not just media literacy not just internet literacy so it's not just about how you interact with web pages you know we all have to understand better and you know I think folks in this room are you know good start like test cases like we have to understand how the internet works you know, one of the different parts. <laughs> Jolly. Oh, internet yeah, Society. Yeah, yeah. The chapter of the Internet Society certainly agrees with that. Um, thank, you, thank you all. I, I would invite you to, to look at the Internet Master Plan, look at the, this last section, phase of implementation, to understand where it's coming. I think you know, Greg is exactly right, that um, looking to your community, understanding um, what your strengths are, how you compare to other neighborhoods, and understanding what, what you think the solution ought to be is, um, is going to be a real strength and a real um, important step to making sure that whatever step the city does take uh, next um, meets the real needs and opportunities that are in each neighborhood.
Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the panel.